Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 158, I chat with video guru Joe Kane about the whole world of 4K, UHD, 2160p, or whatever the heck you want to call it. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded May 6th, 2013, episode 158. It's more than 4K. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek. This week's guest geek is Joe Kane, a video guru extraordinaire and the author of Digital Video Essentials uh, HD Basics on Blu-ray. And we're going to be talking all about what I hesitate to call 4K. We'll get right into that. Joe, how you doing? I'm doing well, Scott. It's good to be here. It's great to have you back on the show. Um, as you pointed out just before we started, you were my second guest on this show. And here we are at episode 158. And uh, so happy to uh, have you back to talk about this super cool and um, uh, Ultra. <laughs> current topic. What's that? Ultra something. Ultra something or another. It's <laughs> ultra. It must be good, right? Yes. <laughs> Hey, those who are watching live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Joe as we go along, and I will pass along as many as I can. So, Joe, we're talking today about what most people call 4K, which in the home is more rightly, I think, called Ultra HD. Um, but even that isn't really that descriptive, is it? Uh, certainly not from my position in uh, trying to help people understand what the reality of this is. But um, where would you like to start and uh, what would you like to know about this new format that's coming? This new format. Well, let's first start with what do these terms mean? 4K, UHD. Um, you're, you're even advocating possibly calling it 2160p. Adding yes. yet more to the alphabet soup that we already swim in. Well, uh, the, the start of this format uh, was a real 4K format. It uh, was essentially the same resolution as digital cinema, which is 4096 by 2160. And so when they first started out, trying to come up with a much higher resolution for the consumer than our 1080p system, it originally started right out at the digital cinema numbers 4096 by 2160. So since the digital cinema world had called it 4K, everybody felt that they could call this new format 4K. But then reality set in. And <laughs> As it we, often does. Yeah, an unfortunate little thing called reality set in yes. and they discovered that hdmi the 1.4 version which is uh in current use really couldn't do a lot at 4096 so they took a hard look at it and said well you know 2160 is twice 1080 why not take 1920 and go twice to 3840 and we'll keep the original 1.78 aspect ratio and uh, we'll still call it 4K because that's what we started out calling it even though it's now not 4K because 4K wouldn't actually work well with HDMI for everything that they wanted to do. So it the name got, uh, it's like when you let the cat out of the bag, the name got out of the bag and it seems really difficult for people to go back and say that it's no longer 4K. My right. problem with that is that uh, the 3840 by 2160 is not a 4K format. And somebody would say, oh, well, you know, 38 is approximately 4K. It's close to 4,000, right? Isn't and, that close and, enough? 
and that's actually not my contention. Uh, if, if if all we were talking about is rounding errors, <laughs> I might be able to accept the name 4K. But um, one of the diagrams I provided you with was, uh, first of all, what 4K is. I think it's called aspect ratio. So let's take a look at that while yes. you're talking. And I had, yes. So what you're looking at, Across the top, in the upper uh, left-hand corner, you see zero. Mm -hmm. And then along the horizontal axis, you see 4096, which was the 4096 format. Now, the 4096 format is a professional format. It's a legitimate format. It is called out by its horizontal resolution because there are multiple definitions for the vertical resolution. And if you look down the side, uh, the left side of the diagram, you'll see that um, uh, 4096 by 3080 is a 133 format. 4096 by 2306 is a 178 format. Uh, 4096 by 2160 is a 189 format. Uh, so... In, in the 4096 format, there were a whole bunch of vertical resolutions depending on the aspect ratio of the picture. Right. And, and, and we have to point out that, that movies are not made with a standard aspect ratio. They are made with different aspect ratios. There are some that are 1.85 1, 1 to 1, some that are 2.35 to 1. And so that what that means is, if and correct me if I'm wrong here, Joe, that while the vertical the horizontal resolution remains the same 4096 the vertical resolution will change depending upon what the aspect ratio is that that the movie is filmed at and presented in that's correct and the reason it's called 4k in the post production industry is because that's the only consistent number in the system and right. so it became known as 4k in the post production world got it Okay, so we started out with the idea that we were actually going to use 4096, and we were just going to use the 189 aspect ratio that is common to projectors in digital cinema. So it's 4096 by 2160. And as I said, HDMI got into the mix, and it turns out that that was a little more data than was convenient to handle in HDMI 1.4 in particular. So, well, am I not correct that also HDMI 1.4 is limited to uh, no more than 30 frames per second? Uh, that's absolutely true. That uh, the HDMI 1.4a doesn't allow us to do anything above 30 frames per second, even right. by cutting it back to 3840 instead of 4096. Now, if we can put that diagram back up for a moment, uh, thank you. What you see in the center of the diagram is 3840 by 2160 in, in red. And if you look, there's not a lot of difference between 4096 and 3840. All right, just a little, two thin little bars on either side. Right, it's 3% on each side. Ah, okay. So it's the difference is three percent, and gee, you, uh, you know, you say, "Oh my gosh, that's such a small number. Why are you even concerned about it?" <laughs> I'm concerned because the content is produced at forty ninety six, and has to be delivered at thirty eight forty. Ah. Now, the problem with that is that there's a six percent difference between the two of them. So putting this in numbers that most people can understand, in the 4096 system, for every 106 lines in that system, there are 100 lines in the 3840 system. So if you try to convert 4096 to 3840... In other, words, in other words, by scaling... Yes, if you try to scale... 4096 to 3840, what you're doing is you're taking every 106 lines in the original system and you're averaging that 
over 100 lines of the new system. So what you're doing is you're averaging six lines over 100 lines, which effectively says you're going to destroy all the lines. When, when you try to integrate six into 100, try to, try to spread six out over 100, you're going to ruin the whole system. Well, what about the pos? I've always thought it would be better to just chop off those three that three percent on either side. Thank you uh, very much. And the first <laughs> ar the first argument you're going to get is from those who want the original aspect ratio preserved. Uh, but you're losing you're losing three percent on each side, so the original aspect ratio goes away. Yeah, it becomes so, a sort of a mini, a tiny little mini pan and scan almost, huh? Well. Hopefully, someone would just do a center cut and right. deal with the fact that they're going to lose 3% on each side. But, of course, somebody is going to get up in arms and say, oh, my gosh, it's not the original aspect ratio. And I actually foresee this being um, a significant headache because, obviously, it has been a topic of conversation in all of the things that uh, we watch. Uh, everybody's concerned about the aspect ratio being the original aspect ratio. And the idea of losing 6% might be upsetting to a number of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The problem is if you lose that 6% by conversion, you're going to lose quality. The whole picture is going to be softer. Right. And incidentally, I've taken the time to illustrate this in an earlier system, before, uh, well, it's not before, but we've always had a 4K system and we've had a 2K system. As much as 4K is 4096, the 2K system is 2048. Right. And the Again, that's a, that's a digital cinema, commercial cinema format, not for the home. That's correct. But a lot of content has been produced at 2K. And then, of course, our current distribution format is 1080p, which is 1920. And so what I've done is I've actually created illustrations of converting 2048 to 1980 and shown people the serious damage that happens to the picture in the process of doing that. Right. So, I'm taking, a, I'm taking a 2048 wide movie image and scaling that down to 1920 for 1920 by 1080 or 1080p. That's it's a similar 6% conversion. Right. And what I've done is I've illustrated that, that it is exceedingly difficult to do a good job of that conversion. Enough studios have recognized that. So if they start out with a 2K master, when they do their 1080p, they will center cut. And once again, the aspect ratio won't be quite right, but... If we don't tell anybody, nobody <laughs> seems to, nobody seems to notice when something is mastered from 2K, and the aspect ratio isn't right. Now, Jammer B in the chat room, our our very own engineer, is asking, "What about a little bit of letterboxing? Wouldn't that uh, preserve everything and not distort the aspect ratio?" I would anticipate part of your answer would be yes, but then you're still scaling down to 3840. You're still scaling the horizontal. And right. which uh, leads to a, a softer image. Yeah. And so, um, no window, window boxing or letter boxing, uh, however you're going to do it. The only real conversion, the, the only real 4096 conversion that works is if the original material is one, three, three, mm. because there is 4096 to such a small portion of 3840 that you can do a really good job of conversion. Of scaling, you mean? Yeah, of scale, uh, yeah, uh, com well, scaling. Conversion, conversion. scaling, yeah. Yeah, uh, same thing. So yeah. that if I start out with a 133 source that's been scanned at 4K and want to come out with a, with a 3840 by 2160, then we can do a good job of that. Because that difference is large enough so that we, we can get a really good uh, conversion. However, there's virtually no material that's generated or created at an aspect ratio of one three three to one. Well, 
uh, if you were to scan old black and white movies or some ah. of the color color movies that are at 133, if okay. you, there's lots of Technicolor stuff that's at 133. Robin Hood yeah. is an example. Um, yeah. you know, the Adventures yeah. of Robin Hood, the Errol Flynn movie right, uh, right. Com- comes to mind. But there, there's a lot of 133 movies. Uh, All right. right so up if you scan those at 4K... Then you can convert them to the 3840 by 2160. Right. Now, we still haven't gotten to why I'm calling it 2160, or I, you know, I've started that explanation. Uh, yes. Part, well, let part us of please reason, continue. Yeah, sorry. Part, part okay. of the reason I want that differentiation to exist is because I want the post-production community in particular to know that they aren't the same format. Therefore, caution has to be exercised in the process of creating anything in the 3840 by 2160 format. Now, I'm calling it 2160p because in the convention by which we have called every other video system we have, by calling it uh, according to its vertical resolution, the vertical resolution of that system is 2160, just as the vertical resolution of 1080p is 1080, or 720p is 720. In other words, 480p is 480, 480. or 576 for the PAL system. We, the, up to the point of this system coming to light, we have always defined our video systems by their vertical resolution. As opposed to commercial movie cinema systems, which we have always defined, I'm now coming to understand, with their horizontal resolution, 2K and 4K. Right. But the reason we have defined them by their horizontal resolution is because the vertical resolution wasn't defined. Right. In it wasn't our, constant. Yeah. In our, in our television system, we defined a vertical resolution and an aspect ratio. Right. So by doing that, and at least in high definition, declaring square pixels, it's really easy to calculate uh, what the um, horizontal resolution is. If you have the vertical resolution and you have the aspect ratio and know that it's a square pixel system, it's easy to multiply 1080 by 1.78 and come up with 1920. Right. Now, I always thought it was a I always thought it was a good idea to have the home version, (laughs) the home version of the game of 4K or whatever we're going to call it at a a horizontal resolution of 3840 and a vertical resolution of 2160, because both of those are exactly double what high definition is now, making the up conversion from current high definition much easier. Would you that's agree? An, oh, that's an important part of them settling on 2160p as a format is that it's it's an, an easy, well-known conversion. Uh, when you're starting out with a 1080p signal, getting to 2160p is something that can be done well by a large number of people, which fits the criteria of a mass communication system, something that is easily accomplished. Yes, exactly. Um, so, okay, well, good. Then, then we know why uh, home, the home version of the game is, we, we want to call it 2160p because that is analogous to 1080p and all the mm-hmm. other, other ways that we specify resolution of a video display. I guess we could call this the difference between the video system and the cinema system. Would you agree that's a reasonable distinction to make? And that would be a nice way of selling 2160p to the consumer, although I don't think we'll ever sell 2160p in the sense that they've already been told it's 4K. And somehow I don't think they'll ever accept it being called 2160p. I am doing that because the distinction between the real 4K and what someone termed the faux 4K format. (laughs) Oh, man, that's going to be hard. I'm sorry, but it is. It's a faux 4K format. And I've seen that in print from a number of people. 
I think there needs to be a bigger distinction between the two formats, if only in the production world to make them aware that they have to look at the difference between the two formats because everything's produced in 4096 and it has to be delivered in 3840. And if they know there's a difference, then they're hopefully going to be conscious of the transition between the two formats and mm -hmm. any quality differences that might happen in that transition between the two formats. Now, Floop in the chat room is saying there are many ways to scale. All outcomes won't necessarily result in softening. Some scalers actually sharpen in the process. Do you agree? <sighs> That's not what I'm seeing at these rates in particular. Mm. Um, I've been spending time in post-production. I'm producing uh, 2160p content, and I'm asking post houses to employ whatever methods they have, which are the professional editing systems and all the uh, scaling equipment that uh, is in those packages. And I'm asking them to use what they might use if anybody besides Joe Kane came in and said, we're going to take this material and we're going to create a 2160p master. But I'm saying that when you do it for me, you have to do it with test signals so I can see what's happening. Mm. And are you creating the these new uh, test signals for 2160p? Uh, yes, I've uh, <laughs> I started that months ago. Mm. Um, oh, probably close to a year ago now. Wow. Uh, started doing this because it was at that point in time that the format first came to light that it was going to happen. And first, the first thing I thought was, gee, we're going to have to test it. We're going to have to find out if it actually works. So I went ahead and remastered about 90 of my test patterns in the um, 2160p format. And but, so, but weren't I, your test patterns in, in uh, 1080p to begin with? Yes. But... In order to produce an accurate 2160p, I've actually got to produce it in that format. Um, as an example, the thickness of a line in 1080p, when if it's a one-line thickness in 1080p, it's a two-line thickness in 2160p. Correct. That's what I was and, wondering about, because you do want to eventually get to a point where you have patterns that are one pixel on one pixel off right I mean, thank you so very much so what <laughs> i'm feeding so, you all this stuff here okay so so what happens is in order to make sure that they're legitimate 2160p patterns everything has to be created in that domain even color bars because the transition between bars is uh, one pixel or one line, depending on which direction you're going in. And if you up convert, even if you up convert color bars, it won't give you the resolution in the bars that the 2160p format can handle. So almost everything had to be redone. Swell. But I guess that's the nature of this business, isn't it? I mean, we're uh, always going to be e evolving and moving forward, so... It, it's certainly the way that um, I'm functioning. I, uh, th there are scalable programs, uh, vector-based programs that uh, can scale anywhere. Unfortunately, the majority of the test patterns I created were not vector-based. So mm -hmm. when I need to increase them to a new size, they have to be redone. Mm. Well, and that's something you're working on now, and, and hopefully we'll you know, see the result of that at, at some point uh, available for people to actually look at on these new 2160p TVs, which we saw all over CES. And you can uh, see it at my home. I, I'm fortunate I have a 2160p set at home. Really? What is it? It's the Samsung S9 series, the 85-inch. Oh, the 85-incher. Oh, well, hey, man. Yeah. I'm I'm yeah. on my way. I want to see that thing up close. <laughs> well, actually, I want you to see it up close because if you're not close, you're not going to see it. Well, this it, brings up the the other the next question. But sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, already. please. 
<laughs> no, I, the question really is, uh, one of the main talking points that people are discussing about this whole 4K UHD 2160p uh, issue is, will it make any difference on a normal size TV at a normal viewing distance? We, we know pretty well that consumers tend to buy things these days like maybe 50 to 60 inches, and they sit maybe 8 to 10 feet away. And uh, so the question then becomes, will the smaller uh, TVs, like, for example, Sony has a 55 and a 65, what they're calling 4K. Uh, uh, Seiki just came out with a 50 or a 55-inch at $1,500. How does screen size and seating distance uh, relate to whether or not this is even going to be relevant in the home? I have my own position on that for for an answer. Well, that's the, what I'm asking for. <laughs> uh, well, and and a lot of people don't like the position I'm taking. So, uh, as an example, um, you can have you can have an iPhone that has a 1080p resolution. And as far as I'm concerned, you can't get your nose close enough to that iPhone to actually see what's in a 1080p signal. Mm. And gee, it's my position, you can't even see what's in a 1080p signal on a 55 inch set. Uh, in, at, a, at a normal viewing distance, I assume. I mean, no, no. I, I don't care how close you get to the picture. Uh, you, you stick your nose up on that screen, you can't see the pixels? It, well, what happens is uh, you actually don't get a good feel for what's in the picture. In well, other words, it's my position that you need to spread the information out over a larger size before you can truly see what's in the image. Uh, I've, I've done experiments. Uh, you're aware that I uh, developed a DLP projector with Samsung. Yes. And we, of course, have the ability to back the projector out away from the screen. So we can start with a small picture and we can have a panel of people analyzing what's in the picture. And in particular, I'm going to bring up encode errors because that was how I did the tests. It was like, OK, we're going to. Um, VC1 encode or AVC encode this material, and we're going to see how fast you can find the errors in the encoding. So right. we started everybody out with a small picture, and there were a whole bunch of errors. No matter how close they got to the screen, there were a whole bunch of errors that got by them. Nobody picked them up. Hmm. And as we made the screen larger and larger, more people these same observers could see errors. By the time we got to a six foot wide image, everybody in our trained observer group who knew how to look for errors could spot all the errors. But we had to get to a six foot wide image before everybody could see everything. And this was among and, trained observers. Right. And as we got to a larger image, it became, oh my gosh, knock you over the head how bad that error is. In other words, we not only didn't miss it, but we strenuously objected to the error when it was on a 10 foot wide screen. We didn't see it on a four foot wide screen and we were jumping up and down. You got to fix that when it was on a 10 foot wide screen. So it is my position that in order to truly see and recognize what's in an image, a 1080p image, it needs to be at least six feet wide. So to me, appreciating a 1080p image, and, I, and I'm, I'll take this another example. When I was taking the projector into post-production, in particular, I took it into a graphics house that is prominent in the industry for special effects and commercials. And when I took the projector in, I set it up at a six foot wide image. And then I ask all the graphic artists to bring their demo reel. Now, all of the graphics have been created on 1080p monitors and some of them on plasma and, and you know, uh, big computer displays and whatever. 
every single artist told me that they were seeing their work for the very first time when they saw it on a six foot wide screen. They understood <clears throat> that technically they had never really seen their picture. No matter how close they put their nose to that computer monitor, they had never seen what they were creating until they saw it on a six foot wide screen. Mm. Now, the particular facility bought one projector and they put it in their screening room for the clients. What happened is all the artists wouldn't let the client see the work until they had seen it on the screen. And of course, that meant that they had to remote their control for the graphic system down to the screening room, which meant they were all doing their own work, all of their work in the screening room. That, of course, forced the post-production uh, facility to go buy more projectors. <laughs> Which is not a bad thing, as far as you're concerned, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, well, and, and it, it was a good thing in teaching people that if you're going to be efficient about what you're doing and you're going to understand what's in the signal, you got to have a big screen. And so all of these experiences in post-production is where... I'm saying if the image isn't at least six feet wide for 1080p, you really don't see everything that's going on in the image. Now, and so certainly go, at four at 2160p, you must you must have to have a larger times, screen. Yes, four times the area. Now, Which four times four times twice, the area. Twice the vertical uh, and twice the horizontal. Yes, yes. That's because it's twice the vertical and twice the horizontal, which is four times the area. Well, yep. a 10 foot wide screen is not quite four times the area of a six foot wide screen. So it is my position that an appropriate size image for 2160p is 10 feet wide. That's so even, the starting even point. The, that's the starting point. So even the that's, Samsung 85 inch uh, is not large enough in your opinion. That's that's correct. It's not large enough. And when you see it, and I'm certain you'll have an opportunity to see it. I look forward to it very much. Uh, you'll end up understanding, oh my gosh, I wish this were larger. <laughs> and yet uh, it took four people to lift it into my house. And <laughs> so... You know, it's it's to to be honest with you, the the set is on a uh, weighted stand. It's on a yes, wait, it's it's on a freestanding stand, and it's just right. Large. And it has a, it has a whole sound system in it too. Yes, but the base has to be heavy enough so that you can't knock the thing over when you, when you run into it. Yeah, and <clears throat> so it you know the the center of gravity still has to be low, right. and so the base in that thing is heavy. And rightfully so, understood all that sort of stuff. Right. But um, it <laughs> it's a heavy set. <laughs> and now we've talked we've talked about resolution, and uh, we've talked about screen size. I want to make sure we also cover the other aspects of twenty one sixty p or four k or UHD, uh, because resolution isn't the only thing that's about to change, is it? No. Um, the interesting part of the International Telecommunications Union specification for 2160p is it has a very large color space. If we can start out with a CIE diagram that uh, has just the single triangle in it uh, for the color space of the ITU 2020 specification. Which should be uh, called REC, REC 2020, John. Yes, there it is. yes, there it is. Um, now, if any of you are used to looking at a CIE diagram with the triangle in it, uh, you recognize this is a huge triangle. Now, I pulled down another CIE diagram from um, the Internet, and this was on Sony's website. I'll give credit where credit is due. Sure. Um, it has the F65 camera in it. So if you look at this and then look at the yellow, which is labeled F65 You'll see that the F65, which is the color taking characteristics of the F65 camera, you'll see it's about this. If you go back and forth between the two triangles or between the two CIE diagrams, you'll see it's about the same size. The uh, the green is even better on the uh, 2020 
specification. But you can see that they encompass huge areas. Now, staying with the um, Sony diagram for a moment, um, you can see the DCI space, uh, which is much further down. And then in the center, you can see what they call ITU 709 space, which is our current high definition system. Right. Look at the huge color space difference between 709 and the drawing for F65. And then realize that this the specification for 2160p goes out beyond the F65 numbers. Eight yet yet beyond the F65. Numbers. Yeah, it's slightly it's slightly larger than the F65 numbers. Wow, how does so, that compare? How does that compare with um, what we call XVYCC, uh, the expanded color gamut that a lot of people tout, but is kind of useless in my well, opinion. Well, all right, XVYCC is uh, we're going to put quotes around useless. Um, yes. yes, because because the color of red, green, and blue isn't actually defined in XVYCC. Oh, the the theory behind XVYCC is that you take you uh, your source contains metadata that can get you from whatever color space something was corrected to whatever color space the display has. When XVYCC first came around, um, LCD displays had outrageous color spaces. I mean, they were just huge, great big spaces that were so out of whack from where our 709 space is that somebody decided, well, gee, we, we need to take advantage of this. And of course, each display is different. And, and right. I'm sure you know from all the measurements you've made that there's no consistency whatsoever to those wide color gamuts of those yep. displays back in the days. Yep. So, so the theory was if I knew what space an image had been color corrected in and I knew the color space of the display, I could translate and I could make this image look great in that new color space, whatever it happened to be. And so the concept between XVYCC is that um, we could have um, any color space we wanted in a display and we could map if something was color corrected to 709, which is where almost everything in the consumer world is color corrected, eh, you know, theoretically we could convert it and make it look good on whatever color space the display was working in. Mm -hmm. And of course, the the big market for XVYCC was going to be cameras, and cameras can take a much larger color space that can be reproduced by a display device. So the big thing for XVYCC was going to be is, oh my gosh, we're going to have cameras that are going to shoot in this larger color space. And it's going to be fairly easy to map from one large color space to another color space, another large color space. It never took off, um, partially because you can't color map uh, images like that. And it's long been proven that uh, you pretty much have to color correct to the space that you want to produce, uh, what you want to reproduce. You can't color correct in one space and then alter it to look good in another color space. And so, so X this, this was an idea that never really took off, as yeah, you say. XVYCC never took off, and that well, was isn't that sort of what isn't that sort of what Sony is doing now with their with their uh, mastered in 4K Blu-rays with the extra data that lets their their displays, which are called triluminous, which have an expanded color gamut, uh, and apparently, what I'm told is that the Sony mastered for four, mastered in 4K Blu-rays have some metadata that allows them to expand out to the 
to the color gamut, the triluminous color gamut of, of the Sony TVs. Do you know much about that? Uh, what I know about it is limited. And um, it is something that could absolutely work as long as Sony tightly controls the red, green, and blue of all of their displays. If they can fairly tightly control so that there's consistency in the red, green, and blue that are in the displays, there's no question it can be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, uh, what they're doing is uh, the transformation between the 709 color space and their triluminous color space is still conducted by a human being. It's still a person that's making a decision about what that data is. It's not an automated process. Uh, that's that's as I understand it. Uh, right. It's not an automated process. It is actually a human being making the decision of what that transform should look like and how it should mm -hmm. operate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we've then now we've talked about the color spaces and gamuts uh, to some degree. There's also the issue of bit depth uh, and. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're getting real yes, geeky here, folks. So uh, hang on oh. to your hats, or, or as they said in Jurassic Park, hang on to your butts. Okay. Um, so up till now, the, the video system that we use uses 8 bits to represent uh, the brightness of each color, right? Yes. And well, uh, Yes, yes, that's, that's true. Uh, the 8 bits, although it represents the brightness of each color, the 8 bits was based on luminance. It was based on black and white. Right. And on the smaller monitors, as an example, at 1080p, on the smaller monitors, you put up an 8 bit grayscale, an 8 bit ramp. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully some people know what an 8 bit ramp looks like. Uh, but if it's if basically you, it's basically a smooth transition from black to white across the that, across the horizontal correct. direction. On a small monitor, it looks like a ramp. On a big display, it looks like steps. Now, I know you've seen this at my place. I've sure. illustrated this. Yes, absolutely. So, And this is another part of my contention that you have to have a big display in order to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you look at 8 bits on a big display, 8 bits is not enough. You do not have a ramp. You have steps. And... Uh, a number of people, especially after looking at a projector, um, uh, uh, my the, whatever my projector, um, after looking at my projector, which is a true 10-bit projector, uh, when they look at 10-bit ramps and 8-bit ramps on a six-foot wide screen or larger, they turn around and say, "How could anybody ever deal with 8 bits? It's not good enough. It never has been good enough." for a real 1080p image. Now, if we're only going to look at 1080p images on smaller displays at 8 bits, it's probably enough. But if you're going to actually look at it on a size display that is appropriate to see what's in the signal, then 8 bits is not enough. All right. And so and, is 10, 2160p, is that going to have a higher bit depth? Uh, in my opinion, it has to. Mm. But it's much more complicated than just moving to 10 bits. Because, you see, a part of my wanting to explain the 8 bits based on a luminance dynamic range uh, between black and white, um, there is also color dynamic range. If we can go back to the CIE diagram that I picked up from Sony that has the F65 on it, um, what you'll see is that in the center of that diagram where the black body curve is, is where white is. Right. And as I move out away from white, there's dynamic range to get from white to a saturated color. If I move the saturated color further away from the white point, it requires more dynamic range to get there. Mm, I hadn't thought of that before. So what we're looking at is the triangle. Let's just pick the uh, DCI triangle um, on that uh, CIE diagram. Uh, the the oh, other one. Sorry, sorry, John, the other one. There you that, go. That one. 
All right, look at the difference between the 709 diagram and the triangle that's labeled DCI. Now, the comparison between 709 and DCI is huge compared to 709, SMPTC, or EBU, all the colors, the three sets of colors that have been used in our television system. Those three sets of colors are really close together. But the going from the color space of 709 to the DCI space, in the digital cinema world, when the image is projected on a perforated screen where you know you lose detail through that perforated screen, test audiences could see the difference between 11 bits and 12 bits. We're not talking 10, we're talking 11 and 12. Wow. To, to get out to DCI color, we had to go to 12 bits, not 10, but 12. And part of the reason we had to go to 12 is because the color space is larger. And yet, and so, if we go to if we go to Rec 2020 for for 2160p, this this much wider yet yet yeah. larger again, you're going to need more I, than 12 bits. Yeah, I've heard predictions of 24. 24 bits per color. Yeah. Of course, we can't do anything better than 16. We don't have displays that do better than 16. Mm. So we're not really sure that 24. But to get to that outer space, <laughs> so to speak. Hey, a try. Um, <laughs> to, get, to get to that outer space is going to require a minimum of 16 bits. Now, that's recognized by the camera manufacturers who are... Uh, generating that kind of color space. Everything is done in 16-bit. So this begs the question of, oh my gosh, are we going to go from 8 bits to 16 bits? Well, the amount of data that is required to do that, especially at four times the number of pixels, is an unbelievably large number, which puts it out of the realm of any system we currently have available that, that would address issues in the consumer world. So, which, which leads us directly. I don't. Let me transporting. Let, transporting exactly and compression. Yes, data compression. Uh, Obviously, yes. we need to compress this down. And 1080p and all video, all forms of video are already compressed. Data compressed. Uh, to conserve the amount of space they need to store it and the amount of bandwidth they need to transmit it or transport it. Uh, and so what's going on on the compression front here to help manage this massive amount of data? Well, certainly um, we've had the advanced video codec, which is uh, codec, I'm sorry, which is uh, known as H.264. And that's what's used in Blu-ray to do a good job of compressing 1080p 24 content or maybe every once in a while 1080p 30. But we're using that. And still on Blu-ray, we're running up to 40 megabits per second. It's a variable bit rate, but we're hitting highs of 40 megabits per second in getting good pictures. Now, if we take four times the data and then we make it 10 bit or 12 bit instead of 8 bit, now suddenly we're talking about input data rates into the compression that H.264 can't begin to handle. Um, as an example, we're looking at 40 40 megabits peak for 1080p 24 in a um, in a Blu-ray. I'm currently trying to compress some of the 2160p content that I've created. Um, I'm starting out with 10-bit originals, and I'm setting a peak data rate in H.264 of 100 megabits with 75 megabits average, and it's not good enough. Wow. Uh, when we put it on the 85 inch set that I have, it fails. It, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's possible we could finesse the settings of the encoder, change the group of picture sizes and all the little things that they do to finesse it. But 
the initial results are not good at setting a 100 megabit peak rate and a 75 megabit average rate. Incredible. To, to do 10 bits. Yeah. What about the new uh, compression algorithm that we've now started to hear about, H.265? Well, here's, here's something that's interesting. Um, I've heard all sorts of reports that, oh my gosh, instead of the 100 megabits per second that I can't quite get a good picture in H.264, I can claims that I can get good pictures at 9 or 10 megabits per second in H.265. <laughs> now, the one experiment where I've actually been able to look at this was on the 85-inch set that I have in my home. The person doing the compression made a totally anticipated comment, is that when the original compression was done, it was done on a much smaller monitor, and they didn't see all the errors that they saw on the 85 inch set getting back to what you were talking about Where earlier. have we ever heard this before <laughs> and they were looking at it and they upped the rate to 16 megabits per second and said okay this is minimum acceptable we were telling everybody oh my gosh we can do it at nine or ten and now we're saying okay 16 and we probably ought to be doing it at 36 uh, if we're on any kind of a decent display. And so what I think we're going to end up doing in H.265, I think we're going to get four times the resolution, 10 bits instead of 8 bits. And incidentally, if I have my way, it's going to be 444, not 420. And I'll explain that if anybody wants to know. But um, I'm after 10-bit 444. Right. Uh, for the... Uh, for 2160p. I want a minimally 10-bit 444. In other words, uh, there's an equal um, bit depth in the black and white and the two color different signals. That they're all equal. That there's there's no difference right. between them. Right. So I that's what I'm aiming at. I think it needs to be 10 bits minimum just to go to 709. Now among the things that are happening, obviously the 2020 specification had that great big, huge, wide color space. And of course, um, that wide color space uh, is going to be pretty difficult to obtain in a display. And of course, we're talking about probably needing at least 12 bits and it's exceedingly difficult to buy a consumer display device today that can do 12 bits. I mean, 10 bits is maximum that you can get out of an ordinary consumer display. There are 40 and $50,000 displays that can do 14 bits in flat panel displays. And of course, DLP in a three chip can do 16 bits. Uh, so there are displays that can do it, but if we're going to call this a consumer format, we're probably going to have to max it out at 12 bits. Understood. That's, that's still that's still a long distance above uh, 1080p, our current high definition system. Well, this brings us to one, two more issues that I just want to quickly touch upon. One is We've talked about um, the increased resolution. We've talked about increased uh, color gamut and bit depth and the size of screen needed to see uh, what's going on. Uh, how does the signal get transmitted from the from the source device to the display? I know they're working on HDMI 2.0, uh, but it's not done yet. And I've heard yes. some people say that uh, it's going to be somewhat hobbled even out of the gate. Oh, it is hobbled out of the gate. Um, I am demanding DisplayPort connections on all initial uh, 2160p. I'm not getting it, but I'm demanding it anyway. <laughs> uh, it it turns out the the DisplayPort. I included a picture of the DisplayPort connection versus oh, yes. an HDMI connection. Um, the DisplayPort uh, connection is on the right. The HDMI connection is on the left. 
They so look kind of similar, but except that the DisplayPort one has a square, squared off bottom left corner, whereas the HDMI one does not. Right. Um, just as an aside, one of the things I really like about DisplayPort is they have a latching connector. Uh, if you look at the top of the connector, there's a plate that there's actually two things on it that snap into place. And then there's a push button at the top of the connector. If you look at the top, the black part of the connector, mm -hmm. there's actually a push button where you have to push down in order to get the connector out. Well, that's so, actually cool because uh, HDMI cables, especially heavy ones with big old connector uh, casings, especially if they're... Uh, inserted vertically, they can actually fall out. Yeah. I love a latching connector. Uh, just side the point. But uh, okay. anyway, <laughs> uh, the capabilities of DisplayPort uh, 1.2, which has been on the market for some time now, are better than are being forecast for HDMI 2.0, the next generation HDMI, which may be out by the end of this year. So DisplayPort, which was available yesterday, along yesterday ago, yes. is already doing better in its throughput capability. So DisplayPort right now could do uh, 2160p, 10-bit, 60 hertz. Could do it 60 right frames now. per second. Could do it yes. right now. Yeah, could do it right now. And that's why I want a DisplayPort on all the displays because every single display can do 60 hertz. And yet the only way you're going to get 60 hertz or the best way you're going to get 60 hertz into that display is a display port connection. There are other ways. I will tell you it is not the only way, but right. it's the only convenient way mm. of getting, the, getting into the display what the display can actually do. Among the things that I'm concerned about in first generation 2160p displays is that computers, as an example, games, gamers love the new 2160p boards that have all this resolution. And of course, the games run at 60 hertz and try connecting that into your 2160p display. Well, if you have DisplayPort, you can do it. But if you don't have DisplayPort, it's four HDMI connections to get it in. <laughs> four HDMI connections. Yes, yes, it's four HDMI connections. And there are sets that have either four DVI or four HDMI inputs. But basically what you do is you put four 1080p signals into it and let the set uh, create Stitch 21. Stitch them together. That's correct. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You put four 1080p signals into the set. Well, the one DisplayPort connector can handle that. Yeah. So, the, for the, sorry. So, I'm just saying, for the time being, um, look for a DisplayPort connection on your new 2160p display. If you Beat have Ma any. Beat, Beatmaster in the chat room is asking that exact question. Do you advise against buying gear that claims 4K or 2160p support that does not have a DisplayPort? All right. Here's. I, I feel I need to justify the position I'm taking. Your initial sources of 2160p are going to be computer. They're going to right. be games. They're going to be your pictures. Uh, incidentally, um, for those of you who take high-resolution DSLR pictures, you've not seen what your pictures look like until you've seen them on something at least 2160 uh, it, it's phenomenal how much better the pictures look. It's phenomenal what the cameras are capable of capturing, and you don't realize it until you see it on a display capable of showing you something close to the resolution that the camera is taking. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I initially feel that games and your DSLR pictures are going to be the most available commodity to feed into your set. So without DisplayPort, you can't run at 60, which is going to... Uh, anybody that's played games at 24 pictures per second knows that that doesn't work. Right. So I'm saying, I'm justifying saying if there isn't a DisplayPort connection on the set, don't buy it. 
Uh, Dr. T in the chat room had a good question. What happens to HDCP copy protection on DisplayPort? Well, of course, there is no copy protection set up for DisplayPort. Uh, it, Hence, we will it, probably not see it. Well, but there's nothing to say that if dis if HTCP can be licensed for HDMI, it can be licensed for DisplayPort. Okay. Uh, there, there, there's nothing to say if there isn't a will. Uh, I mean, if you can if you can put it on HDMI, you can put it on DisplayPort. Yeah. It's just that there has to be a will to do it. But the studios aren't going to release any content without HDCP or or a similar level of protection, are they? Um, I I certainly would guess that you're correct on that. And <laughs> uh, now, uh, if if I may, this uh, provides a bridge into the future. Yes, uh, which was my final topic for the day. We're we're coming to the end of a of a fascinating hour, but I did want to make sure we got a couple minutes on uh, the future uh, and what twenty one sixty p might in fact mean. Yeah, we've already alluded to it, and actually, the HDCP connection to the future is that it's time for a review of HDCP. In other words, it's. Um, it's easy to crack according to some outside sources that have told me that it can be done. Um, so it's probably time for a review of HTCP anyway. So that may be part of a future. But uh, uh, by, by the way, before we get uh, move on there, Undermind in the chat room says, uh, it doesn't agree that HDCP is available on DisplayPort. Uh, rather, it does, it supports DRM, digital rights management, with DPCP, DisplayPort content protection, which I haven't right. heard of before. Um, all right. HTCP isn't part of DisplayPort at the moment. And all I'm saying is it could be, but I'm also implying that if someone decides to do that, it might be a time to review HTCP altogether. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just putting that out there because I think it's future and we're discussing doing new things with HTCP. And I think we should be talking about HTCP itself. All right. Fair enough. That was, Fair the, enough. That was the introduction to the future. Yep. And the future that I want to talk about, uh, I've already alluded to in higher bit depth, uh, going 444 instead of 420 and a larger color space. And gee, while we're at it, why not another gamma, you know, a different gamma? Basically, everything that I've told you about the specifications of 2160p is that it begs for a new television system. Now, before everybody groans, and even me, who has been part of trying to create standards, until a few weeks ago, I would have been in a position of saying it's going to be impossible to get a large number of people to agree on a new system. And I went through that not naming manufacturers, but one particular consumer manufacturer said, you know, look, our TV sets have a great, uh, a much larger color capability than the television system. We want the world to standardize on our sets. And so I went to them and I said, I want a sample of each type of technology that you create. And of course, in their display technology, they created three technologies. I measured all three of them and they were completely different. And I went to this company and said, okay, you want us to standardize on your set, which one of them? <laughs> and I said, keep in mind that the other two have to conform to the third. That was the end of the discussion. <laughs> and those are the kinds of things up until a few weeks ago I've been contending with. What I've come to understand is in the age of digital that if we have a group of standards, as an example, the ATSC Table 3 for 
uh, 18 or 36 rates that are acceptable for broadcast of high, uh, of digital signals. Uh, we set a standard based on 18 or 36, depending on how you count. Now, what's filtered out is two or three, but uh, but originally so all, we, there, all we use are two or three out of those 18 right, or 36. But 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 there were 18 options when ATSC, our digital television system, first came along, and gee, it worked. Uh, it wouldn't have worked in the CRT days, but in the digital era, it worked. And I've been reminded in the past few weeks that it did work and that we could now devise a system of metadata that would allow us to have a choice of primary colors, a choice of gamma, and uh, a choice of bit depth. Now, if we're offered options, there is actually a possibility of creating a new broadcast television system or mass communication system. I'm not quite sure that I should call it broadcast anymore because video is much larger than broadcast. But there is a possibility now that in bringing 2160p with its expectations of being able to do a lot better in many different parameters than our current system, it's a possibility of our having a whole new television system based on 2160p. One of the things that has been asked is, gee, is 2160p worth it? It might be worth it in that it would bring us another much more flexible system where we can take advantage of the new capabilities of display technology that wasn't possible in the days of CRTs. We could come up with a much better affordable color television system. We would just have to carry the metadata with it to tell the system what it's supposed to be doing for any incoming signal. In order to get an agreement on what we might have as a future system, I think we're going to have to do the ATSC Table 3, another version where it's more than scan rates that are the variables. It might be colors of red, green, and blue. It might be bit depth. It, it, it might be a number of parameters that would be variables instead of fixed numbers. I'm actually willing to support that because I have a feeling that a few will sort themselves out and become mainstream popular. And in the meantime, but, we'll get something that's far better than anything we've ever had before. But, what, but won't revamping the entire television system take a very long time? Because after all, you know, it's, it's basically <clears throat> working with all these different companies uh, how long did it take to get ATSC off the ground? Well, um, 10 years, right? Uh, well, it took 10 years to implement it. <laughs> uh, it no, well, you see, it was a transition. And um, uh, in other countries in the world, they didn't give it 10 years. They said, you're doing it now, and that's it. And so the switchover, well, it started much later than our switchover system. Switchovers happen much faster than it did here. Mm. And the only, um, the, the display technology, capabilities in display technology could uh, produce much better pictures if we weren't tied to the CRT as our foundation for our television system. And I actually see the possibility of a much better system. Now, time-wise, when could it be done? Uh, you're going to hate this one. Um, <laughs> there are consortiums of companies already. Obviously, there is an agreement on how things are done. I, I'm going to pick on two, HDM, uh, HDMI and Blu-ray. Okay. Those are, and and, those, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we're really running up against a clock here. So, uh, okay. try and try and keep All it right. brief. <laughs> they're they're private consortiums, 
and HDMI and Blu-ray have been able to do things in a very short period of time, do different things in a very short period of time that probably couldn't have been done otherwise. I'm saying those consortiums exist and it's a possibility that they could just make it happen. Mm. You know what? I would love to have you back again to talk about, in particular, <clears throat> one thing we didn't get to today, which was uh, the idea of 4K Blu-ray or 2160p Blu-ray. I know that the Blu-ray Disc Association is working on a feasibility study, but you know we're unlikely to see that it immediately anyway. Um, and unfortunately, we've run out of time, and I know that there's so much more to talk about. Uh, but stay uh, tuned, stay tuned. Yes. Thank you. And I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, Joe Kane, uh, the CEO and chief, uh, video bottle washer, if you will, of <laughs> Joe Kane productions, uh, author of digital video essentials, uh, Thanks. and digital video essentials, HD basics. And you can get more information about Joe and his work at video essentials.com. Thanks so much, Joe. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you. Uh, you can find me, of course, at avsforum.com and at hometheaterhifi.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Next week, my guest geeks are scheduled to be Stacy Spears and Don Munsell, uh, who have just finished authoring their latest setup disc. Uh, I think it's still called HD Benchmark but I'm not entirely sure. We'll find out next week when they tell us all about it. So I do hope you will join me for that. Until then, geek out. <laughs>